Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm excited about this series. We, um, we wanted to do this movie series, and so we're sitting around the table just trying our best to come up with a great title for the series. And, you know, all the churches nowadays do these series. I think uh, I was, the church we were at, you know, 15, 16, 17 years ago, we did this series, and we just loved it. Now all the churches do them. And we were look, trying to find a name for it, and uh, we were just racking our brains, and then all of a sudden, we just kind of all said it at the same time. But we said, let's do Netflix, and then we couldn't believe it. We couldn't believe how great <laughs> that name was. <laughs> Netflix, the Netflix, if you don't get it, our church's name, <laughs> the Net. So, great series uh, coming up. And listen, we're not lifting up movies. We're not lifting up movies. We're lifting up Jesus. We're lifting up God. We're lifting up Christ and his kingdom. And we're using the movies as illustrations. And the, one, the, the movie that we're doing today is called, it's called The Greatest Showman. Uh, tell me, show of hands, how many have seen The Greatest Showman? All right. Um, you know, I'm not a fan of musicals. I'm a big, huge Elvis fan, by the way. You may not know that, but I'm a, great, a big, huge Elvis fan. Uh, but I can only watch a few of them. There are only a few Elvis movies I can watch because I just don't like the musical uh, thing. But listen, I, I, had to, I had to watch this because it's such a popular movie and we were going to do it. And I had to watch the movie. I was so impressed by the music in this movie. And, and I absolutely love the movie. I was, I was surprised. It was a pleasant surprise. But I... I love this movie, The Greatest Showman. It's about the life of P.T. Barnum. Now, P. Th- it, this movie is not an exact representation of his life. It uh, is not accurate in uh, all aspects, but it's pretty close. And so today, we're not really examining the life of P.T. Barnum. We're really just talking about the movie, The Greatest Showman. And we're using uh, a couple of clips from the movie as illustrations. So... Uh, I was interested uh, in this word showman because it has a lot of, uh, you say showman, it has some negative connotations, right? Uh, So I was interested in in what the definition really is of showman, and I found this definition that I like. Showman, a notably spectacular, notably spectacular, dramatic or effective performer. And I love these descriptive words, the word spectacular, dramatic, dramatic effective, spectacular, dramatic, effective. If somebody described me with these words, I would love it. I would love it if somebody said, Rob is spectacular. He is dramatic. Maybe I, I bet, I bet somebody would describe me as dramatic, especially around my house. Um, and effective. I, lo- I love those words. Um, but when we talk about the greatest showman, and this may seem a little hokey that I say this, but I, I really am serious about this. I was thinking about it. I was thinking, uh, P.T. Barnum was a great, he was a great showman. He really was. Now, he, he was dead and gone by the time I ever went to see one of the Barnum and Bailey circuses. Uh, and I remember, I don't know how many times we went. As a child, I think we went a couple of times. I think I remember us going to Birmingham once and to Montgomery once. And my dad loved the circus, and he would always take us. If there was any circus anywhere around, my dad would take us to the circus. And we just loved it growing up. And then I've seen the Barnum & Bailey Circus uh, before they closed down. We saw them uh, here in town, saw them a couple of times as an adult. And uh, truly, the show, especially when I was a kid, was the greatest show on earth. And P.T. Barnum was uh, absolutely the greatest showman. But I believe the greatest showman is God. Because whenever I look at his creation, uh, I see such power and I see such, um, such energy and I see such beauty in his creation. And every showman and every show is all contained within God's creation. All knowledge comes from God. All talent comes from God. And so uh, God is, to me, the greatest showman. He is the greatest showman. Now, you might wonder, what in the world does a circus have to do with Christianity? 
Well, some of you might wonder that. Some of you might not be such a hard stretch. But uh, what in the world does a circus, a show, have to do with Christianity? Well, I went to this scripture that, uh, that I knew about in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And I, I went and just happened to click on the message version. And this is Paul talking to the Corinthians. And he is telling them the contrast between uh, him, Paul... And his disciples, and, and well, the other apostles, Paul and the other apostles, and their disciples, the people who carry the message of Christ. And uh, he was making the contrast between them and the Corinthians. And so this is how the message reads. I love it. It says, it seems to me that God has put us who bear his message on stage in a theater in which no one wants to buy a ticket. We're something everyone stands around and stares at like an accident in the street. We're the Messiah's misfits. Wow. Now that's a good scripture. That's a good scripture for this uh, week. It seems to me that God has put those who bear those of us who bear his message on stage in a theater in which no one wants to buy a ticket. We're something everyone stands around and stares at like an accident in the street. We're the Messiah's misfits. Have you ever thought about yourself as a misfit? Have you ever thought about yourself as a misfit when it comes to your faith? I have. I definitely have. Jesus was a misfit. He was the only one like himself on the planet Earth when he was here. He couldn't go to a feather... Feather... He couldn't go to a fellow son of God and say, hey, you know, how's it going with you, you know, and, and relate to someone else. There was no one who could relate to Jesus. He was the only one like himself. There's a scripture where Jesus says, foxes have their dens, birds have their nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. He was far away from home and he was the only one like himself. He knew what it was like to be lonely. And so he has called us to be like him. You know, if you've been here long, you know that, that God has called us to be like him. Jesus was not only the Son of God and the Savior, he was the prototype for all of us. He says, Come and be like me. Do the things that I do. Think like I do. Uh, say the things that I say. Act like me. This is what Jesus' message was to us. And the thing that he told us to go and teach was go into all the world and teach them. To obey all that I have commanded. And Jesus upped the bar. Uh, to, to follow the commands of Jesus is much more difficult than following the, uh, the Old Testament commands. It's much more difficult to follow Jesus' command because he raised the bar. He said, uh, I, I'm not just saying don't murder. I'm saying don't hate. He, he, Jesus wants to clean up not only the outside, he wants to clean up the inside. And so he calls us to be misfits. And Paul was saying, it's tough to be a misfit. But this is who God has called us to be. And it's so important. Now, I want to use a story that Jesus told to just illustrate how important it is for us to say yes to him and to follow this call that he has for us. This story is found in Luke. And it's Jesus talking. He says, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who he had invited, Come, for everything is now ready. Think about this. The man has prepared this banquet. The, the man has invited his guests. He is so ready for this party that he has prepared. He has put a lot into it. And he's invited his best friends. And he says, come, for everything is now ready. He has prepared it all and it's ready. Who's it ready for? It's ready for the people that he has invited. But they all alike began to make excuses. First, the first said, I have bought a field and must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. There's nothing wrong with buying a field. If I bought a field, the first thing I'd want to do is go and look at it, walk around on it. Every time I've ever bought a piece of property, and you're the same way, we're all the same way, we just want to go and look at it. We take our friends and our family, come and look what I bought. Come look at this piece of property. 
Lene and I bought a, a lot, a new lot to build a house on a year or so ago. And we like to go over there and walk around on it. There's nothing wrong with going to see the field that you bought. But there's something wrong whenever we put that, our stuff, our stuff. It, and it may be the greatest thing in the world to you. But when that gets in the way of the banquet, when that comes between us and God, us and the kingdom, when it comes between us and the body of believers that God has joined us with, then it's a problem. The, the, the second one said, please, uh, he said, another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I'm on my way to try them out. I've never tried out an oxen before, or an ox, an oxen. Yeah, I've never tried out an ox before, but he was going to try out his ox. He was Obviously, he's trying to better his business. He was trying to, to get more crops in the ground. He was trying to have a better way to get them out of the ground and get them to market. And he had bought the oxen to help him with that. There's nothing wrong with trying to build your business. Nothing wrong at all. I've spent half my life trying to build my business so that I can make a living and provide for my family. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's something wrong when that gets in the way, when that comes between you and the kingdom between you and God. Finally, still another said, I got married, so I can't come. I don't know how many times I have heard this excuse. I call somebody who's freshly married, and if I ask them to do anything, they can't do it. They got their mind on one thing, their spouse, and who, whoever that is. And that is the only thing that matters in the world. And I probably gave the same excuse when I married Lene. Because she would not let me out of her sight. She held on tight. She wanted me with her all the time. So I probably use that excuse. But even relationships, he's, any, you know, even a relationship, it, I'll tell you, in our culture, it's children and sports. I mean, good grief. We have sports on Sunday, we have sports all through the year on Sunday, and, and people. Uh, you know, people choose. The, you have to make a choice. You have to make a choice. What are we going to do? Are we going to? Uh, are we going to make put priorities in our life? Are we going to say God first, God's kingdom first, or are we going to to be distracted by the things of our own lives? I know that's a tough thing for some of you, but when I was a kid, I'll tell you, when I was a kid, and I was involved in a sport or any kind of activity and it was not like it is today and they met on Sunday as a child my parents would tell them you just have to tell them what your priority is on Sunday on Sunday you go and you worship and that didn't happen many times but it happened a few times and I was I think maybe things are different today but I was proud that I had that priority in my life. I was, I was proud as a kid to be able to say to a coach or to a, uh, a leader of some type in the community, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't be there because I, I have to go to church. It's sad that, that, that that's not even a consideration now with, uh, with our activities for our children. Okay, side note, that's not even a part of this. Uh, so he continues, the servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the, uh, of the town and bring the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Aren't you glad that God welcomes the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame? I am, because I, I fall into some of these categories sometimes. Not, not literally, but... Uh, well, literally, sometimes I'm poor. But, uh, and if you join the ministry, you'll get very familiar with this word, poor. But crippled. You know, sometimes I think, that I, I think that I have more ability than I have. Sometimes I think I see, but I'm blind. And I need God to help me see. Sometimes I'm lame, and I don't even know it. I'm so glad that God accepts the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame, literally and figuratively. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, 
Go out to the roads, the country lanes, and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. Now, several months ago when we were talking about inviting people uh, to come to the net, uh, I used this scripture. And uh, what he is saying here to us is go on the outside. Don't, I mean, we, we don't have a problem inviting our Christian friends. If they're looking for a church, we don't have a problem inviting our Christian friends to come with us. But I want to challenge you to do this. How about this? Think of the person that you absolutely know would never come and invite that person. Those are the people who, whose lives, if they come, those are the people. I've, I've seen it many times. The people that you least expect. Sometimes I have seen people that I have been reluctant and not invited to come to church with me because uh, I just knew they would say no. I knew that it was not for them. And, and I've had this happen several times that they show up at my church. And, and, and I see them there and I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed that I did not invite them to come. He's saying go on the outside and invite people. Because he wants his house to be full. He wants this house to be full. Okay. Jesus says, I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. See, the invitation. The invitation is so great. We should be so honored to be invited to the party. We should be so honored to be invited to the banquet. We don't honor what God has invited us to. He has invited us to something that will absolutely change your life. And when my life was changed, I'll tell you, I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked whenever I became a Christian and I found out what God was offering me. That he was offering me peace. That he was offering me joy. And I was shocked at how I came about those things. It was not in a vacuum over here by myself. It was whenever I came together with friends. And the thing that I was most shocked about is what kind of friend you can have in this life when you share Christ in common with each other. I was, I was shocked at how close I could be to another person that wasn't my mother or my father or my brother. Uh, I, was, I was amazed by that. This is what he offer, offers us. He offers us a golden invitation. And it's an honor. Let's roll the first clip. I love that clip. Did you notice the people outside? The people that were outside, they said, Go home, freaks! They didn't even want these people in their town. Go home, freaks. But on the inside, the people who were on the outside, they looked at the people on the inside as freaks, but on the inside, the people had an invitation from the Queen of England, Queen Victoria of England. And so they had an invitation to the royal palace. How closely... Does that resemble the story that we just told about Jesus? The story that Jesus told about the master and the, and the banquet. These people were looked at as freaks, misfits. But yet the queen of England wanted them uh, to come to the palace. She invited them to her royal court. I love that. It's the way it is with God. I want to go back to this passage in... 1 Corinthians, where Paul is making this distinction between uh, the apostles and the Corinthians. So let's go back to that. And this is, we'll pick up with Paul. He says, You might be sure of yourselves, but we live in the midst of frailties and uncertainties. You might be well thought of by others, but we're mostly kicked around. Much of the time, we don't have enough to eat. We wear patched and threadbare clothes. We get doors slammed in our faces. We pick up odd jobs anywhere we can to eke out a living. When they call us names, we say, God bless you. When they spread rumors about us, we put in a good word for them. 
Now, Jesus knew exactly what this felt like. He knew what it felt like to have a door slammed in his face. He knew what it felt like to try to eke out a living with a job. He was a poor carpenter. Most likely had to feed his uh, widowed mother and his siblings. He was the oldest, remember? And so he knew what it was like to pick up odd jobs to try to eke out a living. When they call us names, Paul says, Jesus knew what it was like to have People call him names. They called him the most vile names. He knew what it was like to be called names. He knew what it was like to have rumors spread about him and lies spread about him. He knew. He identified with this. So my question is, why is it that Jesus would call us, the people that he loves, the people who, whom he's invited to the banquet, Why would he call us to this life? Why is it? There's one answer to that, and it's this. Because the reward is so great. It's so fantastic. King David said in Psalm 103, he said, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord and forget not all his benefits. Don't forget his benefits. He Forgives all my sins. He heals all of my diseases. He, he, gives, he covers me with loving kindness and tender mercies. And he satisfies my mouth with good things so that my youth is renewed. He was saying, bless you, Lord. You are so good to me. What you offer us is so good. And Jesus has offered us something so incredibly good. And he knows that if we will just take that leap of faith, if we will just step out and say yes to him, if we will just begin to follow him, he knows what comes next. Because the banquet, let me just tell you, the banquet holds everything that our hearts desire. It's true. That's not just a preacher thing to say. I'm telling you the absolute truth. At the banquet. Everything we want, everything that we desire is at the banquet. And it means that we have to give up some things. Don't you have to give up things in your schedule? A party comes up or an event comes up or whatever. Something comes up. You had something else you wanted to do. And you have to make a decision, right? It's true. You have to give up some things if you want to come to the banquet. You have to put the oxen aside. You have to put the oxen in the barn and come to the banquet. You know? You got you to hold off on the field. You got to say, I'm, I'm not going to go today. Uh, you, you have to make some choices. When God calls you, and we're all called to do different things. When God calls you, you have to make a choice. Am I going to do what God's calling me to do, or am I going to do what I want to do? And I am I'm so serious about this. Whenever you say yes to God, I will follow you. Your life will change. Your life will change, and you will find the, the peace and the joy and the goodness, the grace, the love of Christ, and you will be able to come together with Christian believers, other people like yourself, other misfits like yourself, and the, the fellowship that you have with them, the love that you have between you is unparalleled. It's unparalleled. I'll just say this. There's a, there's a scripture that says, uh, that talks about covenants in the Old Testament. And there's, there's a saying that we have, blood is thicker than water. You know, what we think that means is that family is thicker than friendship. But what it really means is that blood, blood, a covenant that two people have with each other, blood is thicker than water. Water symbolizes family. What comes, you know, whenever a baby is born, the water comes out. Blood Thicker than water. What it's saying is a covenant with a believer is even stronger than family. If you can believe that, it's amazing. 
It's absolutely amazing. That was the thing that shocked me the most. Let's run that second clip. I love that clip. And I love that song. I love these lines. It's everything you ever wanted. Or it's everything you ever want. It's everything you ever need. And it's here right in front of you. This is where you want to be. Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand. You don't have to go off somewhere to find this kingdom that God has offered. It's everything you want. It's everything you need. It is right here in front of you. God is here with us and he speaks to us. He speaks to us in so many ways. And if you will just listen, if you'll just listen, if you'll just be open to him, he will speak to you. He will lead you. And when you say yes, amazing things will happen. But the enemy does not want us to have this banquet. The enemy does not want us to have this kingdom. And so he wants us, like, like the, the, the bad people in this movie wanted to, to call names and, and make these people who were different, make them feel ashamed. The enemy wants to make us feel ashamed. He wants to make us feel ashamed of our scars and, and our wounds. He wants to make us feel ashamed of the things about us, some, some of us outwardly and some of us inwardly. He wants to make us feel ashamed, and he wants to make us feel ashamed of our faith. He wants us to be ashamed. He wants us to shrink back. He wants to, uh, to intimidate, us, intimidate us to the point that we... Do not follow through with God's plan for our life. He wants to do that. And we're going to do a song here in just a minute. The band can go ahead and come on up. We can go ahead and start moving in that direction. I want to talk about this song that we're going to do. It's the anthem of the movie. And it's called, This Is Me. And when I first heard the song and I first watched uh, watched the song and saw the lyrics, I thought, I don't know if this is a church song. You know, I don't know if the message of the song is something that we ought to do in church. I thought, you know, it sounds a little arrogant to me. But the more I thought about it and the more I listened to the words, and we practiced this song I don't know how many times this week, but we practiced this song over and over and over for hours uh, because it was, a, it was a hard song to do vocally. And so as we practice this song, I, I began to think about Jesus and how he never shrunk back from who he was. He never denied who he was. In fact, he made the most outlandish statements, the outland, most outlandish statements, uh, and he, didn't, he never shrink, shrunk back from who he was. And... And so I think that he is calling us to the same thing. And like I said last week, when the enemy comes and he says, you don't deserve this, you don't deserve that. We can can say, I may not deserve the grace of God, but I have it. I may not deserve God's grace, but I most certainly have God's grace. I may not deserve forgiveness, but I have forgiveness Not because of what I have done, but because of what Jesus has done for me. And so we can come boldly, as the scripture says, boldly before the throne of grace. Because, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. And we can say, here I am. This is who I am. This is me by the grace of God. And the apostle Paul himself said, I am what I am by the grace of God.